Welcome to this week's episode of the Wild Art Diaries. It's a beautiful sunny spring day here in South Africa and so I thought I'd record this week's links outside at the back end of the office. Um, we're not going to be hearing from a couple of the team this week. Uh, Trevor is currently in the Masai Mara and his words to me were he's been too busy photographing crossings, lions, leopards and cheetah to record anything for this week, which I suppose is a good thing. Um, so he's been hosting one of our Mara Experience Weeks and it just goes to show that uh, the Masai Mara, even outside of the peak season, so which is typically your August and September months, still delivers incredible sightings. So next week Trevor will be sharing more about these incredible crossings and sightings that he's been having with our guests over the last week. And of course Marlon is currently in Brazil as he starts the second Pantanal photographic safari um, for, for this year. If you've missed his trip report on the blog, um, you definitely need to go and check it out. This is proving to be a very popular um, safari experience in a completely different part of the world. And if you love big cats, then you're definitely going to want to go and check these trips out. Right, so moving on, um, this week's we're going to start off with Jerry's insert, where Jerry looks at some of the parallels between training and photography, so physical training and, um, and accountability as well. Hey everybody, so instead of doing another trip report and behind the scenes thing, I had a thought, I wanted to do something, particularly now on kind of traveling destination to destination, but I'll keep that for another time. I had a training session yesterday, which, excuse my friend, fucked me up completely, right? Now, one of the things, if you follow my Instagram, you'll know I try and train all the time. I've got a sporting background, so it kind of it makes me tick, it's my anchor. I need that to ground me and to kind of work up from there. And one of the difficult things when traveling and doing what we do is that you can't always train. I mean, I always try and do something when I'm on safari. In my tent in the Mara, at the Western Hotel, in my cabin on boats, I try and move, but the practicality is it's not always possible. You cannot always do it. And it's very different doing push-ups and air squats in your tent versus doing power clean snatches and air dine and rowing in the gym. So being a tad competitive, yesterday I did a training session. Now, in the past, up until, when was last year? Two months. I, um, I did CrossFit classes and some strength and conditioning stuff on the side. It was fun and it was competition based, well class based, which there's always that element of competition, right? But if you don't want to go, it's a class, you don't go this, that. So. I came back and I had a point in Madagascar where I spoke to my clients <laughs> and we discussed when you reach that point where enough is enough, right? Whether it is I need to lose weight now or I need to fix my knee or, and I'll link this to later, I need to improve my photography. You get to a point where you think, shit, I need to do this now. So I reached that point a little while ago. When I got back, I got in touch with Eddie. He's one of the coaches and personal trainers at, um, at NCC, where I train, and I, I met with for coffee the first day I got back. I was in Lusaka, I texted him and said, Brew, we need to meet tomorrow. So I, we went for coffee, and I said to him, this is what I want. I need something for me for the next three weeks before I travel again, and then after that, for November, December, January, Feb, before I go to the US, because I need it for me. I'm getting older, I'm 42, <laughs> and I need, to start focusing on me again, because the whole year you get you get lost in stuff. So anyway, uh, met with him, we did a thing, and yesterday I did this first session on my own that Eddie did for me. Now, the point of all of this is, I would I got to the gym, I put my earphones in, I, on my Evernote I worked through this program. I was broken, absolutely broken off yours. I cannot remember the last time. I, I finished a training session and literally just want to either throw up in the corner or just roll over and drown myself in the pool of sweat in the corner. It was bad, really bad. And coming from a sporting background, I can't remember the last time I felt like that, but it got me thinking as I was driving home with my arms shaking, accountability. I can train on my own. I can just go and do my squats, my clean and jerks, my snatches, whatever the case is, but Knowing that I'm paying someone, Eddie, for the program, the accountability that 
He's, he knows I need to be there. I know he's waiting. I'm going to get that stuff done. I started thinking, how cool would it be if, if you could have your own photographic personal trainer? Just think about it for a second. So many people out there, so many of you, bitch and moan that my photography is not getting better and I don't understand Lightroom and I don't want to do this. But my question to you is, do you do the work? Do you put in the time? Do you go to the photographic gym on your own? Or do you wait until you go on a workshop or on a safari with us and then you try and cram in that time? Ain't gonna work. So how cool would it be to have a photographic personal trainer that says to you, listen, Joseph, um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, this is your program. I'm gonna check up on you. On Monday, you have to shoot Aperture. Do the following, shoot 2.8, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 8, 11, 16. Look what the difference is. Do it four times with different subjects and see how it goes, right? Then on, Friday, on, on Wednesday, I would like for you to do the following. Make, have someone throw the ball for your dog and I want you to shoot them at 1,500, 250, 125th shutter speed. Then I want you to go to 60th, 30th, 2010, one second and see what happens and do that five times because then you'll start understanding it and your muscle memory of how to do it will improve. Then on Friday, because you've had a very good week of photographic training, I would like for you to just go sit on the couch, put a blindfold on and take a buff, those things I always wear, put it over your eyes and just play with your camera. Turn it on, turn it off, find the ISO button. Just make sure you know how it works and do that for 30 minutes. Think of it as stretching, right? Do you guys see the analogy here? We get to a point where you wanna improve. I wanna improve fitness and health wise. I'm so sore like I'm sitting here now, I can't explain to you, but I've made that commitment, but I've got the accountability to someone. Now, in photography, we don't have that. Like I said, how cool would it be if we did? I would send you your program, your photographic program for the week, for the month. Then after that, you come in, we do testing. What is your max bench press? What is your maximum time for 5K row? Whatever the case is. How did your apertures go? What are the shots like? How did you pull off the ICM and the panning? And then go from there. So I think the biggest thing for me that's different is I can either bitch and moan about not getting fitter and stronger and losing weight and whatever, or I could do something about it. In the photographic world, and a lot of you guys are the same, I hear this on, on, on things all the time. Oh man, I haven't picked up my camera since last trip. Dude, that was like nine months ago, and now you expect to just get up and improve? It doesn't work that way. Guys, if you want to improve your photography, you have to do the work. And it sounds stupid, but you need to shoot something all the time. It doesn't matter. And now you're going to give me this stuff of, yeah, no, but I only shoot like lions and leopards, hey, because that's like my, my thing. Yes, but if you go on a four-day safari, and the first two and a half days, you are so out of touch with your camera and how it's working, you're not going to photograph them anyway, because you're going to fuck it up. So, the accountability thing, I think it's... And, maybe this is going too deep, but maybe you should be accountable to yourself and say, you know what, Jerry, I'm going on a safari, in, think of it as a competition, I'm going on a safari in six months, or no, make it shorter, in six weeks time, maybe leading up, I should, for the first week, just get used to the camera again, for the second week, play with aperture a bit, for the, first, for the, for the third week, shutter speed, and so on and so forth, that by the time you hit the ground for your safari slash competition or testing, you can get the work done. And then, the, 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 the kicker is, at the end of that, you're gonna sit back at the end of that safari with me or one of my guides, and you're gonna think, Dan, I'm proud of the images I took on this trip from day one until day seven, eight, 14, whatever trip you're doing, because I put the work in. And I think if you, let's, let's finish this up. You do not have the right to complain that your photography is not improving if you're not doing anything about it. That's it. So for me, the accountability I now have, and it's almost a guilt thing. I'm thinking, I've got a hell of a busy day today. I've got two t uh, tutorial, two or three meetings. I've got to go edit this video and a whole bunch of other stuff, prep for presentations and workshop notes and stuff. It would be very easy for me to say, Eddie, sorry dude, very busy, can't make it. But I know I've made a commitment. He knows I need to be there. It's almost a guilt thing. I'm guilting myself into going because I know what the end goal is. How does that translate to photography? 
I don't know. So those are my thoughts on how cool it would be to get a photographic personal trainer. Think about it. Anyway, make the commitment to yourself. Hold yourself accountable and make sure you use your camera more often than not leading up to your safaris. I promise you it'll be worth it. Anyway, I want to have my coffee and get to work now and I will see you guys in the next episode. My name is Jerry I'm from Wild Eye. Have a good one. Bye. Food for thought is always from Jerry and I hope that uh, you guys have taken some lessons out of this and can start to apply um, some of the thoughts and the questions that, and points that Jerry's raised into your own photography and, your, and bringing about accountability and change in your photography. We're now going to go over and have a look at what Al has been up to over the last two weeks. You wouldn't have seen him on Instagram at all because the safari that he was hosting, our Best of Botswana safari, is running through the wild and remote parts of the Okavango Delta. No signal apart from a satellite phone. So this is what Al has been up to over the last couple of weeks. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of The Wild Art Diaries hosted by Andrew. Those of you that follow me on social media platforms like Instagram will know that I've recently returned from what we refer to as the Best of Botswana Safari. And so it makes sense for me this week for my insert to share a little bit more about how the safari was, what kind of sightings we had, and I'll bring up some of my images uh, in this insert as well. Uh, but more importantly, describing what the Best of Botswana actually is, uh, the types of areas that we visit and spend time in, and I'll use maps as an illustration of the kind of northeastern trajectory through Botswana that, um, that took place and just give you general um, sort of feedback and understanding of what the safari is all about and, uh, and exactly how everything went. So let's kick right off and um, I'll start at the most logical place which is the beginning and we flew from Johannesburg into Maun um, and from there took about a 15 to 20 minute ride to um, one of the local hotels, um, Maun Lodge and there we spent one night, had a wonderful meal and preparing all our gear and everything for the start of the, the safari the following day. Um, <clears throat> and then we kind of get really into the thick of things. And the first day started, we got picked up by our guide and uh, we started traveling a fair distance. Uh, that's, that's the one thing about the safari that people need to be aware of is that there are some lengthy travel times between the different places. However, it's not on a tarred road staring at nothing you're still completely within the wilderness and there's every chance to see multiple different species of wildlife along the way. Yes, it's in the middle of the day and yes, it gets pretty hot and most of the animals have either headed for shade or are pretty, lying pretty flat. But that's not to say that on these transfers that you don't see a whole bunch of different things. Um, we saw some rare antelope species like roan and sable antelope uh, on some of our transfer drives and of course various other uh, wonderful bird species that come down to the water's edge to drink. So. Um, the transfers are long, they are hot, and they can be uncomfortable going from one place to the next, but treat it as an extended game drive rather than something that uh, uh, that will hinder the, the experience. So the first was from Maun um, into Moremi Game Reserve, and specifically what they refer to as the Takanaka area. It took me a while to learn how to pronounce that. The Takanaka area of Moremi Game Reserve was our first campsite. And we set up camp there at a really nice little spot right on the edge of a river. And um, that was our home for the first uh, three nights. And really what's important to understand when you go on these safaris, particularly for the length of time that Best of Botswana actually is, is to know that you're looking for sp particular or specific things in different areas that you're going to. And you don't want that to be the, the, the core focus of your experience in one particular area because you might be disappointed. But at the back of your mind, it's important to know that when you're going to a particular area, you're keeping an eye out for what that area might be well known for. For instance, Moremi Game Reserve is really well known for its potential wild dog sightings and of some of the largest wild dog packs um, in the southern in southern Africa, as far as I'm as far as I've, I've been told. And so, of course, you get leopards and you get lions and you get multiple different water water dependent um, antelope species, beautiful birds even sometimes cheetah in that area as well. So yes, there is the potential, of course, to see absolutely everything, but the key focus of Marimi Game Reserve for us were dogs, elephants through these beautiful uh, floodplains and uh, wonderful groves and thickets of uh, jackalberry trees, leadwoods, etc. It's a really, really a stunning area. And that particular area is still quite green at the moment, lots of lush, lush green grass and lots of water around. And, um, and so it really is beautiful for landscape photography as well. So we spent the first three nights in that, in that area, and we were lucky enough to see the dogs. In fact, a pack of 29 dogs. 
Um, for those of you, I think it was around June, July, I shared a sighting from Botswana, the same area of a pack of 20 wild dogs attacking a lioness trying to, trying to protect her three or four month old lion cub. And we saw exactly the same pack of dogs. So they weren't 20 this time, they were actually 29 that had nine new pups. Um, which was really, really interesting to see. I've never seen pups so small, and <clears throat> we actually found the pups moving with the pack for what is probably their first or second time ever. So it was really a, an awesome sighting for us, and we, we thoroughly enjoyed that. From there, we moved across, not all that far, um, to a slightly different area, still in the Marimi Game Reserve, known as Kwai, right on the Kwai River, and that particular area is also known for great species diversity in terms of antelope, there's lions um, roaring every single night. We had fresh leopard tracks around camp every, ding every single day. <clears throat> but the area is well known for um, elephant viewing along the river and leopards as well. And we're lucky enough to see both. We also had incredible lion sightings um, of a male fighting with a female. Uh, we saw about three or four month old lion cubs, uh, two or three of them. And so we had some real great lion pride interaction in choir. From there we moved just over the other side of the river into what's known as the Kwai community area, which is even better for leopards. We had fantastic leopard viewing there. I think we saw five or six different individuals in the three nights that we were there, which is truly something quite special. We heard lions but never saw them, but tons and tons of elephants along the Kwai River, lots of hippos, and of course everyone loves to spend time with leopards, so that was, that was fantastic. From there we had quite a long transfer drive, um, quite hot and uncomfortable at times. Um, but about seven or eight hours transfer from the Kwai Moremi area to Savuti. That's a direct northeast line, and I'll show you on the map and give an indication. But a direct northeast line into the Savuti marshland area where we spent another three nights. And this was completely different. Um, the area is very dry. The Savuti River has been dry. <clears throat> well, I think it flooded in around 2010, but basically for the last 30 years, it's actually run completely dry. So the animals are entirely dependent on man-made waterholes. And for photography, that's actually fantastic because what it means is that you can head to these waterholes early in the morning and late in the afternoon and basically just wait. Um, we had wild dogs near the watering hole. We had beautiful lion sightings. Um, and most importantly, just tons and tons of elephants coming down to the watering holes to drink, particularly in the late evening, along with other rare antelope like roan antelope once again, sable, and, and just great species diversity, plenty of different birds. If you love your birds, that, that's the place to be. So very dry and very different and very dependent on the watering holes, but from a photographic perspective, absolutely fantastic. From there, we continued even further north and east towards the Chobe Riverfront, inside the Chobe Game Reserve, where we boarded a very luxurious houseboat um, for another three nights. And the focus there was to explore the beautiful riverfront and uh, and just to explore the wonderful species diversity that happens in that area as well. Tons of different bird species, most of which water dependent. And I'm not even joking when I say thousands upon thousands of elephants. I've never seen a concentration of elephants like that in my life. Even though I was there in June, July, we didn't see the quantity of elephants that we saw this time. We see them crossing the river. We see them feeding on the islands in the middle of the river and just throwing dust and mud. And that compared with sunset shots is just something to behold. It really is fantastic and crocodiles and hippos and antelope species and if you're really lucky although we didn't get that lucky this time getting lions and leopards coming down to the river to drink but nevertheless we had an amazing amazing time and it's a really nice way to end the the camping portion of the safari which was 11 nights mobile tented camp safari to then end the last three nights on a very luxurious very comfortable houseboat so all in all the areas that we visit truly are the best of botswana and that is exactly why we've called it what we have uh, we try and visit the best areas that are going to give you the best potential to see amazing wildlife in Botswana. And although we don't technically visit the heart of the delta, the northeastern corner of the delta is Moremi Game Reserve. So you are actually in that, uh, that great delta area. Um, and what a wonderful two weeks we had. It's a long safari, hot. October is by far the hottest month in Botswana. So we struggled with the heat at times. But at the end of the day, we walked away with some phenomenal images from, from some truly standout sightings um, over the two weeks. So... Guests were happy, I was happy, and um, the best of Botswana is a wrap. So I'll be sharing some images with you on my Instagram feed over the next couple of days and coming weeks. I'll be in the office for about the next two weeks, and my next safari <coughs> excuse me, is off to Londolozi on a private, which I'm really looking forward to. So once again, thanks for tuning in, thanks for staying in touch, and I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Cheers for now.
So, an incredible safari with amazing sightings. I've just been sharing some of the, the sightings this morning with Al as he's back in the office. And, you know, I hosted the safari last year and two weeks through the Okavango Delta is incredible. And I'll tell you what, finishing off on a luxurious houseboat, it just does not get any better. Um, Mike has also just returned from Medique, which is uh, one of our most popular safari offerings and new Medique dates are coming out shortly. If you haven't already done so, go over to the blog and uh, make sure that you join our waitlist so that you will be the first to receive the new date and rates for the 2019 safari season but Mike and I had a brief chat about why we feel that the Medique offering has been doing so well for us right Mike you've just come back from Medique yeah yeah that's correct yeah I got back yesterday afternoon it, it's yeah. proving to be one of our most popular safaris oh, by far I think most popular and also probably one of our Biggest and quickest sellout safaris. Yeah, they are extremely popular. And and why do you think that is? What do you think makes it work? We get a number of repeat guests. Yeah, but also a lot of people who just really like the idea of, of visiting Medique. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I tell it to guests heading up to Medique now because I transfer three of our guests up. Um, and prior to my first visit um, in Medique, I used to think that it was a reserve not worthwhile visiting mm. um, because of things I heard throughout the grapevine. And um, yeah, my first experience there uh, two, just two and a half years ago, um, I figured that all the information I had heard, listened to and read up on was totally wrong. Um, and I think one of the reasons why Madikwe is so special is of the terrain in the area, it's, it's, it's very different to things like in the low felt, in Kruger, Timbavati, Sabi Sands, the terrain is extremely different, mm. uh, very, very beautiful. And um, you yeah, are very arid and desert-like. Yeah, it's quite it's wild. Hey? It's extremely not that wild. Yeah, scenic uh, parkland landscape that we get down in the Timbavati. And yeah, for sure. Sands. Um, so I think that's a major attraction for a lot of people. Is that even if at times game viewing is a little bit down and then there's not much going on, the landscape that you can photograph or just take in and experience mm. is mind-blowing. The valleys, the hills, um, the rocky outcrops, everything is just phenomenal. Mm. Um, in that part of the world. I really do enjoy it. Um, but then in saying that, if game viewing is on and there's a lot of game around, um, and there is a lot of game in Medikwe. A lot um, of general game, like I, I find compared to Timavati and Sabi Sands, yes. things like Zebra, Vildebeer, Impala, Kudu, Giraffe, you know, the yeah. general game sightings are far more frequent uh, than you would than, in other places, yeah. for sure. Definitely, that's no lie. And um, bird life as well. Yeah. Bird life is absolutely phenomen phenomenal. The, the raptor sightings, um, some certain smaller birds that you won't get to see in the low felt area because they're more uh, driven to these arid cooler conditions or um, drier areas yeah and um yeah so there's a lot of things that kind of draw people's attention to Medikwe and I also think that the fact that there isn't a ridiculous amount of vehicles um on the reserve uh, I think that makes a major difference as well I think that's one of the things uh for, for those of you who don't know, a lot of the private reserves in South Africa, um, especially towards the east, um, so around your Kruger, Timavati, yeah. Sabi Sands, the lodges and properties there are divided up. So you've got your area that you traverse. So you own a concession, a portion of land. So leave, yeah. for example, Sabi, Sabi Sabi is one of the largest portions of land in the Sabi Sands complex, right? How Correct. many thousand Six hectares? Six and a half thousand hectares. Six and a half thousand hectares. How many beds? Uh, wow. That's... Well, Bush Lodge alone sleeps at times 70, 70 guests. Okay. So there's quite a few so vehicles there. And it's not so. to say that it compromises the experience. It does change things. Mm. But if we look at Medique, Medique is a private game reserve of 75,000 hectares. Mm -hmm. And whilst there are two areas or two lodges that have their own concession, they don't block people out of that. They may limit the number of vehicles into their yeah, concession. But sure. essentially, the whole 75,000 hectares is open for you. For yeah, for you to go moving. So that's quite a, a, a big difference as well for you know first time visitors who want to experience a greater area. Oh for sure. Medique is, is, is one of those options. Oh no for sure. I'd agree with that. Um as a first time safari goer and I think a, a big thing as well is it's a, mal a malaria free area. That is very which yeah. really attracts a lot of folk, particularly um these who are either planning on having kids, have kids or are in a certain phase of their life where a risk like that is a no-go. Mm. Um, and I've spoken to many a folk, may have been on Instagram or, or Facebook or even in, in person. That's one of the biggest things that stands out to them. Um, and then some of our multiple repeat guests as well say that what they really love about Madikwe is 
yes, everyone gets a transverse everywhere, but it's not a free for all. A lot of people mm. then do think that there's going to be 30 vehicles in a line sighting. Mm. Um, but the way they manage and control their sightings is phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, everyone gets a fair chance, a fair amount of time. Um, and obviously, as photographers, you want to spend a little bit more time. And guys are lenient. I mean, mm. I'm starting to get to know guys in different lodges in Madikwe now through Grant. Uh, he obviously knows them. And the relationship they have with Grant, knowing that he's now hosting a photographic Wild Eye Week, is awesome because they say, listen, we know you've got photographers. Our people aren't too phased. Spend another 10 minutes. We'll come in after that. Yeah. Which is phenomenal. It makes mean, a big difference. A big world of difference. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, we've just had two guests that traveled to South Africa for the very first time. And um, they were absolutely blown away by the experience in Madikwe. Mm. Um, her, uh, Elaine and uh, Alistair. Alistair was more into your landscape type things. Um, so he was blown away by the vast openness. I and mean, I think a great thing about Madikwe is also the, um, in terms of landscape, the variety of a scene that you can come, come across. Is that it can be a dense area, it can be a semi-open fairly plains-like area like you'd see in the Mara. Mm. You get rocky outcrops, you get these deep, long valleys, particularly if you're moving from the west to the east of the reserve. So I think the, the diversity within one area is mm. absolutely phenomenal, not only game viewing, but landscape-wise mm. as well. So and definitely a, a, a good first go-to place first, for your... Yeah, first-time visitors. Exactly. And I think what, what makes our, our Medique product particularly special is that we take exclusive use of this lodge and yeah. that it's, it's like... It's home. So you walk in, Definitely. you dump your cameras down. There's no one else coming through there. There's no other guests. Yeah, it's uh, perfectly safe. And that's over and above the food, the hospitality, the water hole, which I know you guys had quite a bit of action out yes, there. a lot. Yeah. yeah. Every day we had, almost every day we had elephants. Yeah. Um, planes game, massive herds of wildebeest, zebra, giraffe coming in, yeah. loads of birds. We had black rhino on two occasions, uh, white rhino, buffalo. So extremely productive. Yeah. Um, an incredible little spot uh, it's the downside of that is it makes light rooming because that is a thing by the way um <laughs> it, it makes light rooming in the middle of the day quite challenging because you've got you know these constant interruptions exactly. it's not a bad thing but it, it does make it a bit challenging exactly. but i mean it's it makes light room challenging but it's the great thing is i wrote a blog not so long ago about why do you put your camera down when you get back to the lodge look for the smaller things the insects yeah um the birds in camp whatever it may be Whereas at Madikwe, with a watering hole that's so productive, mm. you don't really ever put your camera down. Yeah. Because there's always something coming in to drink. Yeah. And on our last full day, we had a big herd of zebra, massive herd of elephant come in. It was not, not a huge watering hole, you'd know, so it's, it's quite confined. And when elephant get to a watering hole and there's not much space around, they'll make sure that they make their space. Yeah. And we had these elephants chasing zebra through the water splashing everywhere, running absolutely crazy and yeah. put on a massive show for, for us on our last afternoon. Nice. Which is I mean, action you'd wish for when you're out on safari. Yeah. It's so much better than you can actually sit on, on the couch, step. have a GNT and photograph animals at the watering hole. It's very, very special. Nice. Now, you're um, actually going back up to Madikwe next month, eh? Uh, yes, I am. Um, I will be. And then I think Alistair joined or he continues there after at Nkuru. So I won't be going to Nkuru. I'll okay. be going to a very different lodge in Madikwe. Brilliant. But uh, yeah, Nkuru, um, Madikwe as a whole, you won't go wrong with with uh, booking that particular safari. It is an incredible experience. Fantastic. It really is. Good stuff. So um, we've done a lot on Madikwe and on our safaris up there. Um, we'll post some links to some previous trip reports. If you guys have been waiting for the dates, they are coming out in the next week or so. Um, and uh, yeah, just a, a great trip. What was what yeah, sure. one of the highlights for you on this last one? Yes, on this. Well, we had. A, there's many. There's many a highlight. Choose one. Um, one. One. Yes, that's tough. Eh? I think we had a, a young elephant bull drinking at a watering hole, and we were quite worried. We were on standby um, to approach uh, a pride of lion, and we had a big stormy sky with. You could just see how it was raining there. And you were kind of, it's that moment where, yes, we need rain, rain's good. But when you actually saw that, <laughs> that cloud burst and just start yeah. pouring, you kind of wished it away. You're like, please don't come this way. Yeah. So we had these very dark gray skies with the water falling, very, very white, and this elephant moving across a very dark background. Um, and to me, that was a standout highlight. It was absolutely yeah. phenomenal. See, not only photographically, but having this dark elephant, dark gray skies, and this 
basically arrow of white shower coming straight down towards the elephant was was phenomenal. And there was a, a beautiful sighting and a sighting where most of us put our cameras down and just watched lightning, Brilliant. breath, thunder. It was after a very hot day, so it was a blessing that it was nice and cool as yeah. well. Um, so that was a big standout um, highlight for me. And then, um, yeah, yes, we had an incredible lion sighting on the last morning. Uh, we had two lionesses walk literally right past our vehicle, look at all the guests as they walk by. Two massive male lion. Um, the fact that they both ate half a zebra each <laughs> kind of aided that. Yes, they were huge. And four young cubs came walking, strolling straight past the vehicle, which was magic. And that was ending our last morning in the decree and our last day. So, yeah, it ended on a very high note, which was a great highlight. Brilliant cool. stuff. Yeah. Thanks, bud. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Appreciate it. Ciao. Cheers. Bye-bye. Right, so don't forget, if you are interested in joining us in Medequin next year, you're going to have to be quick. And by getting a head start and sending us your details so we can add you onto the wait list, you'll be the first to receive the new dates and rates when they're released, probably in the new week. Finally, for this week, we're going to have a quick update from Johan, who's living it up in the lap of luxury at the fantastic Londolozi private game reserve. Hello everybody, I hope you guys have had a fantastic week wherever you might be. I'm back in the bush again, but um, this time not on an official wild eye safari. I'm actually with, um, with clients who I guided a few years ago and they've kindly invited myself and my wife at, uh, well, to Londolozi for four nights. So we're at Founders Camp in Londolozi. So a bit of, um, bit of a holiday break if you can call it that. But really, really excited to, to be here. I've been, it's a property I've been wanting to, to see for a very long time and explore, having heard so much about it. And to be honest, it hasn't disappointed at all. It's, um, we were actually um, chatting with the guests at dinner last night. And when you're in the, in the lodge industry, you kind of look for, for faults. And to be honest with you, we haven't been able to fault anything so far at Londo's during our stay. Um, and then from a game viewing point of view, it's been absolutely phenomenal. There's been good, uh, good numbers of, of lions in the area. Actually, two prides with very small cubs, which have been very entertaining to, to view and photograph. And also quite a fair amount of leopard activity, which you kind of expect um, from, uh, from this area in the Sabi Sands and especially Londolozi. Um, for me then, from a personal point of view, from um, trip-wise, I leave again on Sunday, head off to, to Cape Town for five nights, and then straight after that, back into the private concession in Kruger, um, called in Bali, also there for another four nights, and then head off to Vic Falls, and then straight after that into Medikwe for our Medikwe photo safari. So, a busy few weeks ahead, but super excited to share that with you guys. Um, and we'll catch up with you guys next week. Hope you guys have a fantastic week. And um, as always, thank you so much for following along. I really appreciate it. Till next week. Cheers, guys. Have a good one. Right, that's it for this week. I hope you guys have enjoyed uh, another productive episode of the Wild Art Diaries. As always, if you have questions, comments, and ideas for future episodes, please do get in touch. From me, that's it. I hope you have a fantastic weekend, and I'll see you again in a couple of weeks' time.